So um, our first speaker is Dr. Harold Freeman. Uh, and um, I would like to make a couple of special comments um, about Harold. Uh, I think all of us um, hope during our careers to meet people who are very special and truly inspiring in their work. And for me, Harold is one of those people. He's one of my heroes. He's somebody who many years ago was able to see a problem that most people missed um, and then conceive a solution that most people didn't think of. And it's to a large extent through Harold that I think we're all here today. He's currently the chief executive officer and president and founder of the Harold, <coughs> Harold P. Friedman um, Patient Navigation Institute in New York City. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of surgery at Columbia. And if you read his bio, has many, many other accolades uh, through his career. Uh, but Harold, I think, is going to give you uh, a historical perspective uh, from his view, uh, having um, worked in uh, Manhattan for many years in Harlem. So Harold, thank you very much for coming uh, and being with us today. Thank you very much, Larry, for your introduction, and, and Lisa. It's a real privilege to be here, and I have a, a short time to say what I'm going to say. And I'm going to try to look at well, what is patient navigation from the origin concept, and why did it occur, and, and how did it occur. And it's, it's a complicated set of issues. But to be very straightforward on it, I came to Harlem 50 years ago, 50, exactly 50 years ago, a long time, as a well-trained surgeon. And I, I was very idealistic at the time. I wanted to cut cancer out of Harlem. Surgeons think like that. It doesn't always work, but we think like that. And I can't tell all the details, but it wasn't possible to do that. Why? Because the problem was deeply rooted in the social economics of that community. It's not, it wasn't strictly a surgery problem or a medical problem. Other things had to be understood. And it took a long time to try to understand those things. I faced women in the breast clinic that I uh, was in charge of early on uh, who were coming into my clinic uh, with masses that you could see from an inspection, sometimes ulcerated on the first visit. So it was very disturbing to me to, to see that and began to think of what to do about that. Early on, I created ways for the women to be screened uh, for breast cancer at two different sites. It's a longer story. I was not going to the, the details of how that occurred. But I did solve the issue of providing the tests that the women needed an examination uh, to get into the system free of charge if they could not pay, so by 1979. Um, but I began to see that many women who were screened uh, were dropping out and they were lost to follow them. And I, and I didn't know what the quite answer was that for that. Something else occurred. In 1989, uh, I got promoted to a position from which I could see the, the whole country, which is different from seeing your community that you work in and live in, which is also very important, but it becomes a different look. And so in that position, I held hearings uh, in America, in seven American cities as president of the American Cancer Society, hearings on cancer in the poor. Cancer, what, the question, what happens to poor people who have cancer? a lethal combination. And from that testimony, the concept of navigation arose. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. We, we concluded, for example, that poor people of any race, of any ethnic group, meet barriers when they attempt to get into and through a very, very complex healthcare system, which we do have here. Barriers. So let's focus on that word, barriers. That, that was a leading word. But they said more than that. They said, we make sacrifices to try to 
pay for health care, losing their houses, losing their jobs, losing their automobiles, losing, worst of all, losing their dignity. They said that. They said the educational system in America at that time, 1989, is often insensitive to us, even irrelevant. Uh, sometimes you're telling us to do things that we can't do. Um, they expressed the point that they had more pain and suffering. Why? Because they had late disease. Other things were said. But from that meeting, from that year, from the 1989 year of looking at cancer and the poor, uh, the concept of patient navigation arose. Because if people can't get into and through a complex system, maybe, maybe you can navigate them. Maybe, I thought. And so we started that in 1990 at Harlem Hospital in a clinic that I had, had established for free screening. And we brought in lay people as the first navigators to be with me and the other doctors when we examined the patient and listen to the dialogue and then take the patient to another room and ask certain questions such as, did you understand what the doctor just said to you? And so, so often the patient had not really understood the navigator would find a way to explain. You were, you were told you need a biopsy. Is there any barrier? I don't have health insurance. We have to try to settle that, find a way to get them covered. Or simply, I'm afraid, and I don't trust these doctors. I don't trust this hospital. Then we have to find a way to, to find a dialogue with them to, to alleviate fear and, and uh, and distrust and other things. So that's how it started. And let me put a subtext here. It started as an attempt to answer the questions in a singular community. It did not start to plan a national program, which I'm very happy about that this did occur. But we weren't trying to solve a national problem. We we're trying to solve the problem in Harlem. So we did that, and we began to notice good results. By 1995, we had published the first paper on patient navigation uh, that showed um, good results. Uh, in later papers, too, we showed, for example, that in Harlem, before screening and navigation, the five-year survival rate in Harlem for breast cancer was 39 percent. After screening and navigation, it rose to 70 percent. Still not as good as the national average, but much better than it was. So we thought we had, we had touched on something, but we didn't know how universal this might be. But then another thing happened. I had a chance to present this to other venues and got a lot of other support. Finally, it was presented to the Congress as an idea, a concept, the patient navigation, uh, with a lot of other help. And, and in 2005, President George W. Bush signed the, the Patient Navigation Act. That put navigation at a very high level of recognition. That's an early history story. So that's how that happened. I'm going to show you a few slides here to, to try, to, try to illustrate my points. Which one? Which one? So this is President Nixon in the White House signing the National Cancer Act in 1971. A wonderful thing for a president to do, and it did a great deal of help. The progress that we have made over the last uh, nearly 50 years after this has been largely related to the amount of resources that were put into research by this act. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. On the side, maybe not as good, President Nixon said, this war against cancer will be over in about eight years. <laughs> that, did, that didn't quite work. It didn't, didn't quite work. Because he had the idea that it was kind of a magic bullet to be found, that you could find the bullet, use it, and it's all over. Like putting a man on the moon, which did occur. So we have a from that, a wonderful discovery system 
but perhaps not so good a, a delivery system. I mean, the fact that there may be at this time 30 million American people who don't have health insurance, it used to be 50 before the Affordable Care Act, now it's about 30. Still, just on that point alone, people cannot pay for and get into the health care system for care, even for a disease like cancer. So there's a disconnect between discovery and delivery. Now, where does navigation fit into this? Well, navigation then uh, could be part of a solution for this because if we have a, a, a delivery system that needs a lot of change, then maybe if you could come up with an, an idea that bring navigators into the system to help individual people through the healthcare system to a resolution of some kind, and that's the concept. And that's what we try to do. So patient navigation was started. I won't go into this slide. This has to do with disparities related to poverty, how people behave, what are their resources, and whether they're treated fairly, acting across the healthcare continuum. Not time to go into that. And here's an important look. Poverty causes certain negative events. The fourth box is the healthcare system box. The menace access to health care. But you know, the fact that there are four boxes means that you can't solve it in one of those boxes. You have to be concerned not only about the menace access to health care, but also about inadequate physical and social environment. Uh, people who need social support have poor housing, less knowledge, risk promoting lifestyle. All these things are important to understand. And navigation attempts to encompass all of these things. So I've gone over this. I'm not going to repeat the American Cancer Society finding. So what are the principal barriers that we find? Financial barriers. People don't have insurance or can't pay for transportation. Communication barriers. Health care system barriers, a complex system to get through fear and distress. These were the initial things that we tried to solve through patient navigation. And this is the model that we first came to in Harlem. In 1995, we published this. And if you look at it, we picked up the patient at the point of abnormal finding, a very important point. And we tried to solve the problem through resolution by diagnosis and treatment. Now, one significant point about this slide is, before this concept, we were picking up the patient at the point of cancer. In a poor community, like Harlem was at that time, if you begin to navigate at the point of cancer, you are navigating people with late disease. So you have to start before cancer occurs, particularly in a poor community. Certainly, it helps to navigate anyone at any point along the continuum. But we started with abnormal results. That meant that a woman came in with a lump in the breast or a suspicious mammogram. We began to navigate at that point. And uh, this was the, the model that we used. The results I'll quickly show you. In the time period before screening navigation, we had only 6% women had stage 1 disease. 49% had lake disease. After navigation, that was 39% five year survival. After navigation, ending in the year 2000 for five years, we changed the early disease to 41%, lake disease to 21%, and five year results from 39 to 70%. That was what we did earlier. And this was what was presented to the Congress at that time and finally signed by the president. And this is a picture of George W. Bush signing the Patient Navigator Outreach and Chronic Disease Act in 2005. And you can see that the president appears to be happy on this particular day <laughs> because he is, he is smiling. Okay, okay. He wasn't happy all the time. <laughs> so we, we then developed a larger model, more universal model. Whereas we were navigating from abnormal finding to resolution before, we expanded the model across what we call the healthcare 
continuum. And here's a large concept that's worth uh, thinking about. So what is the healthcare continuum? In medicine and surgery, as a surgeon, we're treating one patient as well as we can. Uh, I know that very well, operating on people one by one. In the healthcare continuum, we're, we're interested not only in that, that must continue, specialties continue, but we're, let's also be concerned about the movement of a person across the healthcare continuum to some point of resolution. Starting with prevention at the bottom, early diagnosis, treatment, and post treatment quality of life. That is the healthcare continuum. So we believe that you can navigate people across the continuum. That breaks it out into an outreach component, a clinical component, and a survivorship component. I won't go ahead, don't have time to go deeper into that, but that is a, a, a huge idea in this concept that there is a healthcare continuum, not just episodic treatment of a patient, but also being, being concerned about the patient moving to an endpoint, to resolution across a continuum. I came up with certain principles I'll, I'll touch on, some of them, because my time is limited. Please tell me when I have five minutes. Uh, I mean, so, um, so as I see it, and this could change, here are what I consider to be the principles of patient navigation. So navigation, then, is a, is a patient-centered healthcare service delivery model. This means one-on-one. -on -one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think this is a fundamental thing. Um, I will ask any one of you, not, not actually, what are your most important relationships in your life? And each one of you will tell me one-on-one. -on -one. This is your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your grandparents, one-on-one. -on -one. So why not one-on-one -on -one with the patient, one-on-one? -on -one. The core function of navigation is elimination of barriers as we've said before, barriers, financial barriers, communication barriers, system barriers, um, fear and distrust. Another point, patient navigation has the power to serve or can serve to virtually integrate a fragmented healthcare system. And very commonly, people have a, a, operating within a fragmented healthcare system. Well, patient navigation can virtually integrate the system, closing the dots as the patient moves to several parts of the system. In most places, people don't get treated at one place only. In fact, that's probably pretty rare. They have to go to several places, and, and the navigator can virtually integrate the movement of the patient to an endpoint, even though the patient goes outside of where you're assigned. That is the concept. Patient navigation needs to be defined with a clear scope of, of, of practice. Who should navigate? Uh, often raised question, because so many people are involved and they sh should be involved. Um, who should navigate depends on the phase of navigation that you are undertaking at a given time. If you're navigating in the community, you bring in community people to help you. When it gets to the clinical system, it could still involve lay people in that system, but it brings in people with professional training, such as nurses and social workers, keeping your eye on, on the prize, that is the movement of the patient uh, through the system. You need to define where navigation begins and ends in your system. Navigation can connect healthcare systems, navigation such as primary care and tertiary care. If you have navigators in the primary care setting and in tertiary care setting, and marry the navigators, don't, don't, actually, don't marry them really, but bring them together, you can actually bring primary care settings together with tertiary care settings through patient navigation. And coordination is, is uh, required. And let me get toward the end of my, my time is nearly up. So let's talk about coordination. And here's the example that I would like to leave with you. It's, a, it's the example of the mile relay, and a, a track event that you all have heard of. All right. In a mile relay, I'm making an analogy between, between the mile relay and patient navigation. Listen to this. So in the mile relay, there's a certain distance that has to be traveled. 
from the beginning to the end, a mile relay. In the mile relay, there are four runners. I want you to imagine that the runners are navigators. In the mile relay, the runners or navigators are carrying a baton. I want you to imagine that the baton is the patient. All right. In a mile relay, to pick the runners, you pick, you pick people who know how to run. First of all, yeah, that's another important point. Pick runners who can run. So the first runner who might be in the community runs with the, with the baton, the patient, to the second runner who works in the, in the diagnostic clinic and passes the baton. Now, you know, you cannot drop the baton because you will lose the race. So there has to be that connection between the community person and the first clinical person. That person will run and pass it after diagnosis through radiology to another runner who might be in the, in the clinical setting. Pass the baton, you can't drop it again. That could be a surgeon. And perhaps it's passed then to a medical oncologist who <clears throat> carries the baton across the finish line. So the race is not over until you carry the baton across the finish line. And that's in the larger sense of what patient navigation, I believe, should be. A team effort. Uh, cooperation between people in the community and the clinical setting. Aiming toward resolution of some kind, carrying the finish line. And adding the final touch to that, you will never have an Olympic championship mile relay team unless you have a good coach. Somebody has to be looking at the whole race from beginning to end. The navigators are engaging in phases of the race and are connected together. The coach is overseeing the whole race. So we make a distinction between the navigators who act in phases of the race and navigation, which is the whole race itself, a concept. Things that have happened, the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer issued a standard of care, a patient navigation. Mandated that patient navigation it must be a part of a cancer program in order to meet approval, a big thing that happened in 2015, so that the 500 or so cancer programs in America uh, under this college now must have patient navigation process. The Affordable Care Act, written in 2010 under Obama, requires that states use patient navigators to assist uninsured people to get into insurance. The Affordable Care Act also renewed the Bush signing of the Patient Navigation Act at that time. So here's the timeline, and I'm, I'm moving toward the finish. In 1989, the hearings on cancer and the poor, we found out that poor people meet barriers. We, we thought of a solution that maybe we can navigate them, that concept. A year later, the first patient navigation program established at Harlem Hospital. First publication five years later. Between 2004 and 2008, the, the different agencies got involved, like the, the National Cancer Institute, the uh, CMS, Patient Navigation Act was signed. The money from the Bush signing went to Health Resources and Service Administration. And so this is a quick history, and I, I'll leave you with this diagram. I'll finish with these remarks. Patient Navigation is a concept that we came to. Um, uh, through lots of struggle and, and thought, a concept <clears throat> that has to do with something called the healthcare continuum. We have to think of patients moving across a continuum to an endpoint. <clears throat> Patient navigation is a process uh, that has to be overseen so that the patient is moving to an endpoint and is being seen in an organized way. Patient navigation is an intervention carried out by patient navigators. And so with this, I, I end my remarks, and I, I think that uh, this concept has 
uh, we'll, we'll see through the rest of the two days how much uh, research there is behind it, how it's being practiced, and uh, I think we're on the, the, the um, top of something that has great value for the American healthcare system. Um, and I'll end with this point. So we're talking about personalized medicine now, more than ever before, uh, particularly in chemotherapy. So you now can say, well, this patient has this particular cancer, and I'm going to an analyze the, all the mutations of the patient, and I'm going to give this particular drug to this patient for this. And that's a wonderful thing to have, personalized medicine to the individual person treatment. Let's combine that with personalized navigation. Let's be personalized not on a scientific medical front, let's be personalized on concern for the patient's socioeconomic and cultural conditions to move to an end point. Uh, final statement. No person should die because of late diagnosis. People shouldn't die from cancer because they're poor. No person should be bankrupted because they cannot pay for their treatment for cancer. Um, and yet, the number one cause of bankruptcy in America today is failure to pay medical bills. Let's navigate our population. Thank you very much. I can't think of a better way to have started us off and set the stage for the next day and a half. So thank you very, very much, Harold.